I never thought at 51 years old I'd be telling people that the bogeyman isn't real. You said the optimal word, Chris, fear. Today I went to test with cancer. Whoa. Whoa. They're always willing to trade away a little of their freedom in exchange for the feeling, the illusion of security. When you think about the leaders, the captains of Project Fear, there's a couple of names that jump out, aren't there? If you're in the UK, a couple of those names might be... But the fact remains that still lots of people are watching the news, watching the TV and getting a very different message because they don't take in the same information maybe that you do or don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. So for friends listening, it's not that I don't care about people. It's the complete opposite. When you when you remember that, that everything in the I've got to be really careful what I say here, but. We need to remember that in science, everything is a theory. And when we put all our chips on one theory and we say that all the others are just completely irrelevant, that is, for me, a really dangerous thing. And the reason is I haven't lived the mainstream way for 18 years. Um, And my understanding of life as such is so extremely different and it's why I get extremely good results from my from from my life sorry guys I'm having to leave lots of gaps in here you you I hope you you, you, you're following me but by spreading this I'm just going to say the bogeyman story you're denying children young people anyone who's trying to educate themselves about life and become enlightened and understand their body their physiology their mental health how these this set cluster of molecules is vibrating at a certain resonance as dictated by this beautiful universe right you're saying right folks you are never going to learn that your whole life because this is this is the mainstream narrative and it's incredibly it's, it's the equivalent of knowledge fascism or totalitarianism. The other thing as well, so that... I think what you're saying there, Chris, look, when I wrote this book, Massive Advantages of Dealing with Our Souls, there's, there's, there's a lot of confusion because, number one, we can always... Everyone's an arsehole, right? From day to day, we can all do our soul things. And we all make mistakes and some things we mean, some things we don't. Most of the time we don't mean it. So you've got your everyday arsehole that everybody is. But based on what you say in there, Chris, we all make decisions based on our experience, based on what we believe, based on what it is that we want to achieve. And what I've always found helps is there's two things that define somebody who you might define as toxic or as a, an arsehole that you may want to avoid or not have in your life. And those two things are consistency and intention. How consistent is somebody with their behavior? How consistent are they with being an arsehole? Because if it is all the time, then that's an issue. But the big part of the ingredient that needs to be looked at is the second one, and that is consistency sorry intention it's intention you've got to look at somebody's intention why are they doing what they're doing what is their intention see your the choices that you make and again we can focus on this math thing but because i know it's a big debate but you're making that decision because you believe maybe on a grander scale that it is the right thing to do not just for yourself but for people around you because of maybe something that you're aware of that other people might not be aware of. And because they're not aware of that, then they might see you in a different light. 
But for you, making that decision, your intention is good. It's positive, right? What I'm getting at here is it's always about someone's intention. Is somebody doing something to intentionally hurt others? Is somebody doing something to intentionally be negative, to harm? Then that's something very different. And that's for everybody to judge. You can't judge that. I can't judge that for somebody else. That is their own judgment. But deep down, if they believe that you're doing that and making that decision with good intent, then for me, that's the overriding thing that counts. Do you think also that, sorry, I'm gonna, I am gonna list this list for, fr for our friends watching. It, it's, we're gonna enter now the biggest mental health snowball and suicide epidemic this country has ever experienced. How do I know it? Well, you should see how I felt last night after this, you know, it, it rocked. I'm a stable guy, I'm balanced, I'm enlightened. I, I want for nothing, but, but I am, I do stick by the, I try to be as moral as I can. I've, as Carl said, I fail a lot and I try again, but with certain things I, I can be quite rock steady and fear I will not give in to, nor blackmail, nor threatening, or anything like that. So last night, I just felt for every other person that must not just be feeling like me, but have been been caught in their houses and under house arrest for for uh, uh, almost two years. And it's not it's not quarantine; it's house arrest. Quarantine is where if I get ill. They go and put me in a hospital and say, Chris, you, you just stay on your own for a couple of weeks, old son. We just want to check you out. The heebie-jeebies are gone. Then you can go back in. That's not what we're talking to here. We're talking mass house arrest. Why? Because the BBC told you, not, not a letter through the door from any governing body. The, B, the BBC told you. Who told them? Well, you know, the likes of Bill Gates a guy that made his fortune by stealing a computer program and a whole host of other rogues who please believe me really don't care about you anyway so we've got that we've got people drinking themselves to death we've got alcohol and substance misuse gone through the roof mm -hmm. right um we have this we we have now only given one side of science to our children. That's it. You know, it almost as backward now we are is the days when we thought that the if you sailed off to the edge of the world, you went off the edge. That that is the the level of education we've been reduced back to. Um, on top of that, the businesses people have worked their whole lives for, borrowed money for, work the, the hours that that many of us do, all gone, right? all gone on top of that you've got people that are physically scared of their fellow humans at a time when we should all be hugging and understanding empathy love kindness compassion the only things that get you to enlightenment all the hatred the bigotry the fear the the, the bad vibration the all of all of that just block completely blocks you and the time you know we should be spreading the love no you've got youngsters like I said this the other night, you know, I, I go in a supermarket, that youngster dives in the frozen food section to get away from me. Right. Yeah. This is the, this is the, and when you want, when you understand what all this is based upon, then you understand how utterly frightening it is. And I'm not going to go there for the purpose of this podcast with Cole, but many of you know that this goes an awful lot higher than what we're ever going to see certainly on mainstream media that you can even now see on on the platforms that we broadcast on because some of them are so corporate controlled by their advertisers that that you can't have freedom of speech um there's a whole bigger thing going on again again folks and i, I can't even talk about it so well, they're just a, in regards to how you felt yesterday chris Let's put it into context because ultimately what you're talking about is 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 feeling empathy for other people feeling the experience feeling how bad it can be 
to be locked in your home, feeling how bad it can be to feel isolated, feeling just generally how bad things can be. You felt empathy. If we put this into context, because I think things like this can be taken out of context when you start talking about psychopaths and sociopaths and the psychology side of this, but it's, it's very simple when you put it into context. There are, on average, about one in a hundred people is a psychopath, but it's not always like Norman Bates, you know, that's the, that's, that's the impression that we've got, right? So that's why, you know, the, the, we, we start to take things out of context. When you consider that one in a hundred, and when you also consider that from a business perspective, a lot of CEOs are sociopaths or psychopaths because they naturally filtrate to the top. Why? Because they don't experience emotions and feelings like you did yesterday. Mm. They don't. Some people might say they don't suffer that. Right. So imagine going through your day where things are as clinical and raw as looking at data on a, on a whiteboard, blackboard, computer screen, whatever it may be, and it just being about hitting those figures. Forget about everything else. It is just about achieving that. That, when you start to put it into context, a lot of CEOs filtrate to the top, politicians, people in power. A lot of these people have these traits and they don't experience emotions and things like a lot of people do. So when you put that into context, it, of course, explains a lot of things and enables us to do that because it's very easy to start saying this and start saying that, and then you start going down tunnels that, you know, can can you know just warp your your your, your general awareness. When you start to put it into context, it, it starts to make sense. So you're feeling empathy yesterday, but there's a lot of people that don't think and feel like that, which is, I believe, a big reason as to why we're in the position that we are today. Yeah, I reckon if you went to the Bilderberg meeting. I think it's just psychopaths and sociopaths. Odds, odds would suggest that there would certainly be a percentage. Mm. Well, look at, you know, not, I'm not going to say any events in particular, but I think everyone knows the events, uh, if you're our age, that we're talking about, where they didn't bat an eyelid. Um, don't even want to say the word, but let's say at the expense of thousands of people in in their own country. It's not to mention the millions killed abroad. That that's kind of like a psychopath, you know. Again, you know, look, I like to put things in in common sense and, and context because it, it's so easy to overcomplicate things you mentioned about you know being being human and what it means and what it means for the experience what it means to feel like you did yesterday what it meant for me when I spent decades being riddled with fear and anxiety not able to leave my home there's always this fine balance based on choice based on experience based on the fragileness of what it means to be human compared to the strength that we've all got, compared to the resilience that we've consistently demonstrated that we've got as being one of the greatest accomplishments, ecosystems that the planet, that the world, whatever you want to define it as, has ever seen. There's always going to be that fine balance, always. And what will it ultimately come down to? Well, for me, I can't speak for everybody else, but I'll tell you what it comes down to for me and this is where we go full circle because we go back to what we spoke about at the very start it's very much your relationship with fear how you perceive it what it is and ultimately your belief system behind that how do i put this into an example when we go for tests for cancer or when we go for things that are going to challenge us on that grand scale which you're facing at the minute Chris that will present a lot of choices it will present a lot of challenge and some of the fears that it will invoke are two of our greatest two of our primary fears 
the first, of course, being the fear of death. It's the great unknown. What is it? Well, nobody knows. So that's why, based on all the what ifs, we feel all the fear that we do. But when somebody says, well, I believe this happens after you die, or I believe that happens after you die, I say, great. Some people will say, nothing happens, that's it. Other people will say you transcend and you, or you, you know, you go on or you do this. Death is whatever you want it to be. Whatever you believe it is, Chris. Mm. Why? Or well, who are you or I or anybody else to tell you any different? Because no one really knows. So if nobody really knows, then what does that basically mean? What it basically means is whatever you want to believe is true. And when we start to appreciate that that is very much factual based on pretty much everything else in our life, we can start to get a better relationship with fear. Yeah, I should add that. So my test came back. Oh, they weren't bothered. The, the medical people, they said, no, nah, it's, it's right. Correct. I, I, I honestly wasn't bothered if they turned around and said, yeah, it's not looking good down there, Chris, you know. Uh, I'm I'm not afraid of death. I'm, I'm, Why not? Well, from the moment the universe started, which is an infinity ago, if that's even an expression, until the moment the universe continues on, which I think is also infinity, I have always been here and I will always be here because I am the un I am universe. That's what I'm made of. So as I say a lot in my, my life coaching, this conversation now is just the universe. Imagine the, the, the earth or, or whatever. It comes up like this in molecules that grow. This bunch of molecules, we're going to label Carl because it makes it just like easier to get shit done. This bunch, we're going to label Chris. And hello, Chris. Hiya, Carl. How are you doing? It, it's come from the same suit. It's the same thing. It's universe experience in itself, right? It's, Carl, this might just be my belief, what, whatever. But to me, this is the one that makes a lot more sense than let's just say the sort of stuff they taught us in Sunday school. And so I, if I'm universe, well, I've always got to be here. So there's no point stressing over anything, Okay. Uh, maybe I let myself down a bit today, but, but you know, this incident on the phone last night, uh, because my, my, my friend said, no, you got to go. You got to do, do the thing and go because you might die. And I said, no, I, I, I would rather die because at the end of the day, I have to look myself in the mirror and I'm not going to look a coward I'm not going to look at myself as a coward. Just, just uh, that must be a horrible thing to have to live with. I, I think, I, I, I just do, Carl. You know. I, I, Listen, I mean, look. I think what's interesting in what you said there, Chris, is we are we're we're governed by our greatest fears, mm -hmm. and we live by them. And our greatest fears define what we do and what we don't do. So what's interesting about what you just said, Chris, is your bigger fear is being a coward mm. rather than actually dying. Mm, massively. So, so that was the fear that drove you to make the decisions that you did. You decided the last thing I'm going to be is a coward. So that was that the, the fear of being a coward was the thing that drove you to, to do what, what, what you did. And I, I suppose the balance that I'd probably add to that, as in maybe a question mark, certainly when there's terms like coward involved, is where pride might come into it. Mm. Because pride can be a bit shitty. Pride is very much attached to the ego. And the ego, well, that, that will do any number of things to keep us trapped, right? So I I'm not going to be a coward. You know, and a lot of that's kind of ego stuff, you know, a lot of it could be you know, pride and that's fine because it can connect to morals and standards. And that's why we keep to that. But ultimately, I think what I picked up on, Chris, is the one of the underpinning reasons as to why you made this, the decision that you did is because you just felt it was right. 
It's on, only, mate. It, it's really simple. Bill Gates, uh, you, you can name them all. Larry Silverstein, Donald Rumsfeld, Bush, Blair. I'll stand up against them all every, every single time, Carl. You know, they're, they're all of that. It, I'll put them all, all in the same, you know, along with all the politicians that are going along with this. But the difference to the politicians is they're just gullible fools that are all being blackmailed. Or if they're not being blackmailed, they probably genuinely think that, or they're on a power trip, so they just do it. The difference with the ones above them is that they actually know they're, they're party to the agenda. They, they know what's going on. It gets a bit darker there. And then, of course, you've got the, 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 the darkness that the likes of you and I are never going to see or possibly never even understand. But you can Another believe why, you know, probably again, going back to yesterday, why you felt like you did yesterday and why I can relate to that so heavily. Yeah, so I'm not afraid to like mess things up or even be scared Carl I'm not ego like that I, I, I I'm for me it's more it it just in life you just got to be a warrior and we haven't always been I haven't always been like I mean there's been times where I have and then I probably had years where I didn't do warrior like stuff but warrior I don't I mean, well, I like challenging the deepest preconceptions, preconceptions within our subconscious. Mm -hmm. One of your deepest ones is that you have to be a warrior, make them back to training, you know, and all, all stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. It will naturally do that. But in regards to challenging that, do you? Do I what? Sorry. Do you have to be a warrior? Um, when I say warrior, Carl, it, it's a very misleading term. I... I would apply the same philosophy to to understanding the universe, to getting diet right, mm -hmm. to learning how to meditate, to getting a control of the e ego, which is a what once you know that you need to control it, that then I guess it becomes the more of a challenge than when, you, when you, what's your what's your end goal as a warrior? I want to set the next generation off just as best as I could. Just mm -hmm. as you know, I want to know that when I when this set of molecules goes back ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and next week I'm a palm tree and a pigeon and whatever it might you know my molecules are spread everywhere um i.e universe i i i just like to look my son in the eye and say son i just did my best for you you know i did my best um so when i feel like shit uh, 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 it's, it's a little bit more rare now but I could certainly say that it was more relevant previously. One of the traits, and again, I'll go back to what you said about feeling the way you did yesterday and how lots of people are feeling right now. When I felt like shit, so much of it was connected to me trying to control lots of aspects, not only in my own life, but externally. I was trying to control this, control that, control this, control that. And in our current situation, it makes it even worse because let's face it, we, in regards to freedoms, liberties, decisions, have never been so far out of control, arguably. Mm. So when you add that feeling of feeling out of control, it, it, it can just emphasize any bad feeling that we might be having, any anxiety, any feeling low, any feeling stressed is just amplified because of the environment and what's going on. What always has helped me, and I try and, and it's part of the training and it's part of just a, a, a constant reminder, let alone daily, constant. What is it that you can control? What is it that you can do? What is it that you can control? What, because it goes back to basic things as basic as a decision. The decision that you choose to make next, mm. like the decision that you made, whatever that meant, that was a decision that you made because you wanted to take control of that, whatever. 
when we can focus on the things a little bit more about what, what it is that we can control. There's going to be all these things externally, environmental, things happening in areas and over here, over here, over here. If we can just refocus, because I'm all about the individual as well, Chris, I'll tell you that. I'm all about the individual. Mm. You know, I've, obviously I do my videos, um, I do coaching, I do all these different things, but I'm always about the individual because I know that if you can do certain things as an individual, then that collectiveness that you were talking about, about us having different experiences, but all being one consciousness, one energy, one awareness, however you want to call it. Mm. If on an individual level, we can just refocus, make decisions, take control individually, then collectively, sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if we individually could understand, Carl, the, the futile nature of, you know, you, you, for example, your life experiencing, in, in experiencing itself in Russia, I'm life here in the good old US of A or where, wherever, that we're the same, you are me and I am you, that's therefore the notion that I need to wage war on you is... It's like literally I'm, I'm punching myself in the face and thinking that's going to get any kind of good result. Do I want you that set of molecules and this one to awaken? To, yes, absolutely. From that individual nature, that's the, 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 the couple of things I'd say is that the, the, uh, the controllers... They were they well everything I'm saying and you're saying they they know this a hundred million times over they they've known it for thousands of years it's you know that they've read the books and then they burn them um, they really know if they can keep us in our left brain which they do incredibly well with the education system we're never going to develop the cognitive ability to have a conversation like this Carl so that's good credit to us too I think. Well, it's a little bit like the Agent Smiths in The Matrix. Uh, there's a lot of Agent Smiths that have been popping up that want to tell you to, you know, do certain things and, 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 and constantly remind you of what you're not doing right. And it's this multiplication of, of, of Agent Smiths just popping up all over the place to doing the same job. And I think it's a really good point that you've made. If there was Agent Smiths popping up with a level of, of the the type of energy and awareness that you're talking about and that's a very different experience isn't it yes the other thing as well um is you know i work on myself a lot um i seem to go in like real big leaps so for example maybe this last month i could feel like i've learned more in this last month than i did in the previous year it might be a book I've read that sent my thinking. So I really got myself to the place, Carl, where I was seriously questioning. I think a lot of people are, are here now. Where is it or is the spiritual battle within? Because there's always going to be good and evil in the world, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, is it about getting control of yourself, reigning in that ego, putting out good energy, put it putting out good stuff for all human beings and, and really, you know, really. You ever tried to love somebody when you hate yourself? I've loved people when I didn't realise how fulfilled I wasn't fulfilled, Carl. It's, 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 it's just, it, it's, I'm not necessarily saying it's impossible, but it's certainly a lot harder that if, we don't like ourselves how can we expect anybody else to like us or love us the point i'm making here chris is what you've just said there is there anything else as a starting point as as the point from this moment onwards is there anything else than within and what i mean by that is that how can you expect on the flip side of what i've just said to love somebody else if you don't even like yourself how can you expect to really be able to help somebody out if you can't help yourself? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a fundamental thing. It's possible. 
But here's what happens, because it happens all the time. You don't feel good within yourself, but you twandle off and go and help somebody else. Maybe do something. I don't know, maybe even just like a physical task. Maybe you felt a bit knackered, a bit shitty, but you, you help somebody move out or something like that. That's a very trivial example. But let's say on an emotional level, you help somebody out with a problem that they've got. But deep down, you're feeling crap about yourself. And, you, you know, you're all smiles and like, yeah, no, look, let, we'll get through this. But deep down, you're feeling horrible and anxious, just horrible within yourself. You're not laying any form of foundation for yourself. So when the big bad wolf comes along with the problems, he's just giving it a quick blow and your ass is down. Mm -hmm. Until you start working within, on your own building, on your own foundation that you can start to build on top of, then that wolf's always going to come along, have a little blow and, and blow your ass yeah. down. Whereas you work on yourself, you work within. It's a very this, different story. This is this is the crux of what 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 I'm trying to sort of highlight because I don't really understand it if I was honest, is like I sort of consider I live in paradise. Simply because if I hop out of bed and I always say like, and it's a bad day, but the truth is I, I, the only time I have bad days these days when I'm coming down off certain prescriptions, let's say, which is very extremely few and far between. And it's normally a few points with the lads once or twice a year. And, and after it, when I get out of bed with that bad head, I, I still know I'm the luckiest person on, on, on the planet right and and everybody else is even if they may not have realized it so i feel fortunate for that i mean i when i go for my little jog in the morning i just love life so much and i love myself so much and i i love just the experience of it all it's just phenomenally incredible to be here be here now what my challenge is, Carl, and hence this, you know, warrior sort of thing is I've had to chop down quite a lot of stuff to get here. You know, I've had to stand up when, when I needed to. I've had to look myself in the mirror more times than I ever cared to imagine. Um, I've had to forgive an awful, awful, awful lot, which is fine. You know, it's, it's not, it's not when the time's right, it's not difficult, but the point is, I could sit in a garden with a sun on my face and I'm, that's all I need in life. That, that's, I'm made up, give me a book, I'm just even better. But when they're coming for your children, this is the bit I'm hot, you know, I can do the internal bit. Maybe I'm not doing it well enough. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe I there's some stone i haven't you're not missing anything it simply goes back to what i said about the things that we can control and the things that we can't can we control the psychopaths then it, it, it with collective action what well, i mean it, it's a pointless question it's a pointless question because whether you say yes or no to it makes no fundamental difference to the only thing that matters what you do Okay. Right. The more important thing than that is what it is that you decide to do. Mm. And the reason why we can get bogged down and feel overwhelmed, particularly by in, in incredibly raw subjects like the next generation, kids, the issues, what's, what, what's happening in regards to next generations. The reason we let that stuff overwhelm us is because of the amount of things that we can believe is out of our control. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Is there stopping it? Can we stop it? Can we do this? Can we do that? All of that from a moral standing in regards to having things to focus on, in regards to being the warrior, in regards to achieving things, in regards to getting things done. It's perfectly normal. In fact, it's advisable that we have those levels of fear because there's nothing else that's going to drive us into action, which is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. However, where it starts to get really destructive 
and counterproductive, i.e. we start to bring ourselves down, is when we get overwhelmed by the things that we can't control. And there will only ever be one thing that you can, and that's yourself. Anything outside of that, right? I, uh, before I was a coach, before I started writing books, I ran a recruitment business, my own business for 10 years, right? I got to see all different sides of people, all different sides of personalities. And no matter what, when you thought you had someone figured out, they're definitely going to get that job, right? They're, they're, they're stonking it, right? They're going to sail in. I can't tell you the amount of times that it just don't happen because human psychology, the stock market, none of these things work on logic. That person I thought was absolutely nailed on to get the job could have easily just as walked in and kicked the guy in the knackers if he wanted to. Why? Because I can't control him. I can only control what I did, what I do, what I did throughout the process. What did I do? I helped prepare him as much as I could. That's what I can do. There's a certain point then you have to say, that's what I did. Mm. I fit my morals. I fit my standards. That's what I did. Now it's up to them. And if you want to take that above and beyond anything else, good luck to you, is what I say. But if you don't expect to live in terror, fear, constant anxiety, and just feeling like shit. It don't work like that because this is how fear works. You will constantly live in the what ifs, you will live in the future about what you can't control and it will dominate you to the point where most people won't even take action because hey, fuck it, I've lost anyway. So there's always that balance, isn't there Chris? So it's not a question of, can this or can that person or can, will that person get the job? I don't know, but I've certainly done my part. And there's a point where I have to say, I can let go. Mm. Brilliant. Cole, let's move on because while I've got the benefit of chatting to you, I've got a couple of things written down here. In fact, I'll just read them out. One is TikTok and the other is moon landing. <laughs> TikTok and both, moon um, landing. There's some bloody subjects, Chris. Well, I find both... Um, <laughs> Let's do this. Should I, we do I, TikTok first? Yeah, come on then. What, I I cancel it. Move, move on. Done, done. Job done. Yes. Get rid of it. It's awful, isn't it? What, you, you, you tell me what social media platform that accentuates all the worst qualities in us humans that's probably that's too that's too stereotypical let me rephrase this is it social media that's bad or is it simply the amplification of what it means to be human well, that's the question i don't know but what i do know is tiktok is certainly one of the key players in regards to being nefarious Would I want any child, any children to be using such a platform um, and, and, and think it's something healthy to do that in no way creates a narcissistic, emotional sociopath? No, because everything about these platforms are about that. They're about bringing you in. Their social engineering is about bringing you in and keeping you there. And whenever there's a nefarious agenda like that, oh, but it's free. Well, if it's free, then that means that you're the product. Brilliant. So if you're the product, you need to start asking yourself some serious questions. I've actually got a TikTok account. I don't hate me. Um, the, only, the only difference is mine. It's just the same boring shit I put on all my other platforms. It's it's um, for the day when I can put my feet up and move to the Caribbean. Um, I think like like people pull me up on some it, right? Because I I out of all the platforms, there's one that really stands out for me, and that's Facebook. I I can't stand it. But people say, well, "Why you still got a Facebook?" And I say. 
I've never used Facebook on a personal level in my life, and I never would because I despise it. But in regards to running a business, in regards to having a profile, in regards to it being a commercial decision, well, then you've got to use a bit of common sense. You've got to be able to strike a balance between it being commercial and supporting you commercially to then it drawing you in and, and you playing farm games on it and being completely addicted to it. Exactly. And it's, and it's the same with TikTok. Why? It, it, look, the fundamental question is always why. Why am I doing it? Right? If right now somebody says to you, I'm using TikTok uh, because it's fun and, you know, but really fundamentally what it's about is they're looking at how many likes they've got, how many views they've got because ultimately that's what it really comes down to. Then of course that fits into the nefarious agenda. If somebody said, well, I'm using TikTok because I just post what I'm posting all the other stuff to increase my profile. then that's a little bit different, perhaps, yes. perhaps, but I will take the criticism because what somebody might also say is, well, being part of the platform is part of the problem. I totally agree. Yes, there's a, there is that, isn't there? I, well, I mean, I think being part of any, my, my get out of jail free card is always that I believe the message I'm putting out is worth being a prostitute to these Silicon Valley psychopaths. I don't, I probably sound really rude. I don't mean this rudely, but I just don't understand why you'd want to go in public and tell everyone what you have for dinner. And in is if, it's if that's in any way important to anybody. It's such massively um, self-absorbed, if not narcissistic, it's self-absorbed. It, it, it is a clue, Chris. These Silicon Valley lot, you know, the senior execs, the engineers, the designers, don't allow their own kids to use their no. products. And can I just say, I don't consider, because I just... I've been trying to delete my personal, uh, not, you know, deactivate my personal Facebook for, for ye years now. And there always comes an issue with the business that I'm like, oh, this week I can't run adverts. Why? After three hours of, so oh, it's because I've deactivated, I'm running it from someone else's. A careful what I say in case Mark Zuckerberg's listening. But, but I don't consider that I've got the moral high ground because I just do it for business because it's still people must be looking at me doing my run every morning and doing some, you know, some wise old words and they might be trying to emulate me, but in, in their own, <laughs> in their own life. But it's interesting when you look at the, uh, the agenda of the new world order, destroying community, destroying family, promoting communism um just how these platforms really do just self-absorb youngsters into this absolute um world of meaningless driveling nonsense and I, I don't i don't mean their lives when i say this because our lives are very important to us i mean the fact that they're not watching a nature documentary or reading a you know reading a book which i i couldn't go a day without reading just one page of, of, yeah, of, of you know as a, as a kid chris i wasn't doing those things uh, what i was doing is is an 80s version of what they're doing now is on the computer you know, I was bored. Uh, mm. you know, compared to kids nowadays, I, I spent more time playing football and being outside. So there was that. But the issue that we face, certainly from the youngsters' point of view, is they want things entertaining. They want things quick. They want things convenient. And they're bored. And what social media and computer games and all the rest of them is offer that. Yeah, and, and, and they offer it in abundance. So in regards to competing against that as a parent, it's a, it's a tough job. And it will always be a tough job because they've mastered the art of entertaining them. Mm. And then when you add 
our biggest fear, I've already mentioned one of our primary fears, that's death, but the other one's even greater. Social acceptance, people. That's our biggest fear when we start to appreciate that as a life changer. That's, then, where, that, that's where being a sociopath probably comes in quite handy or have some sort of narcissistic personalities or we just don't really care what people think. Correct. <laughs> if you could bottle that, that would be probably be... Well, that's, uh, again, that's why I wrote that one. You care too much. It's, uh, I can't about, wait to read it. It's about the mentality of, of being affected by social anxiety and the sort of mentality that you can adopt to counteract that. Does it give you an advantage um, for a sociopath? It's, it's the ultimate edge. Um, how, do you, how do you define Carl's social anxiety? Because to me... Caring too much about what people think. Okay. And where's the line between caring too much about what people think and actually you are a bit of a dickhead? Is, 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 there, is there a balance to be had in that? Well, it's like I would say, I would say I try not to really care what people, I mean, you, you, you know what it's like, especially when you're a content creator, you can't invest too much of yourself in, in that. You'd never be able to do what we do. On the other hand, if I was going out being a bit of a knob all the time, you know, putting myself, lording it over other people, bigging myself up because I'm, or, 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 or just stuff that I know is, well, maybe I don't, didn't realise was, was just a bit rude and a bit arrogant. Yeah. I, I kind of want to care what people think, you, you, you know, because I'd want yeah, to... Yeah. I'd yeah. want to rain re re it in a bit. Yeah, so what, so what we're talking about there is awareness, self-awareness, being aware of, of how much of a dickhead we are and how much of a dickhead we ain't. But this isn't, this is what this book's about. You care too much. This isn't about, you know, the people that say, oh, I don't care what people think. They're the people that care the most. Why? Because they wouldn't even have to say it. This isn't about not caring about what people think because everybody does. It's a fundamental tra trait. It's built into us. We care about what people think. That ain't going to change. So what you can change is the mentality towards it and the message that you're telling yourself. Rather than saying you don't care, say you can't care. Because when you say you don't care what people think, you're lying to yourself. You never get anywhere. When you say you can't care what people think, that's literal. Because if you do care, it's going to ruin you. Brilliant. Can we talk about the moon? Yeah, go on, you go first. What do you want to know? Um, <laughs> all right, how about that? We landed in 1969, was it? Yeah. And Nixon had a great phone call. What, why was it? In that case, how come, like when Branson went up yesterday or whenever it was, he's, yeah. he's absolutely creaming in his pants that basically went about as high as the lowest cloud you see in the sky? Was that they very generously allow him to call space, which equally probably just meant the parabellum effect where the plane went up and as it comes down, you feel momentary. Have you used VR? And vir virtual reality. Have you ever used it? Um... Yeah, you put like the the, the, the the VR goggles on. And yeah, stuff. I'm I'm having deja vu here. I'm not sure if I've used it or I'm remembering watching some video about somebody use some. Well, let me tell you something. There's this the, 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 you can buy. It's pretty cheap now. You can buy these goggles and and you can put your phone in it and and you know you like people are like dropping on the floor because it's like you can really feel like you're on top of a building for example right but there's these centers all over the uk now you can go there and they're vr centers and they've got all different types of vr and one of these things that they've got is a pod and you can sit in a pod and this pod you you sit in it you put your vr goggles on you hold on and what this thing also does 
is it blows wind at you. Some of them have even got like wet that they blow at you and all this sort of stuff. And as you, there's one particular one that I use that I literally had to take the headset off because it made me feel completely disorientated. It's this big swing and it makes you feel like you're literally swinging over a big city and you're on this big swing, swinging over these buildings. I don't, I'm not great at heights at the best of times, but being in this pod, it goes up and down, it shifts you like this. And it, in other words, this is very basic technology, very basic, that is accessible. So if this is the type of technology that is accessible to Joe who wants to go to a VR center at the weekend or whenever, then you could probably assume that the technology is, is probably more advanced than that. And I had to take the goggles off because it felt so real. That's probably as much as I like to say about what I believe. Yeah. I'll just say here and now, this conversation is not for the 99%. This is for the 1% listening that know, just know exactly what we're talking about. And yes, you're, you're, you're correcting your, your assumptions. <laughs> or your, um, I just find it really... I, I actually disagree with you, Chris. I actually disagree with you because all I'm suggesting is like I do with anything. You know, in regards to, I like asking big questions. You know, that's why I've got the community that I've got. You know, why I've set up Carl's community. I like asking big questions. I like having workshops and asking people big questions. Because however you look at it, don't just take my word for it, right? If you watch the TV and stuff like that, then you probably heard of Brian Cox, right? Professor Brian Cox is moving his air to the side, are you? Right? He believes that we might be living in a virtual reality. So don't take my word for it. There's, he's a professor. He's actually called a professor. Wow. You know, and be, he's an expert. You know, I'm not an expert. So, you know, I'm not an expert at the weather, so I can't say anything about the weather, apparently. But he's a professor. He believes that we might be living in virtual reality. So... It's just a question. I'm just asking a question. Is it possible that we are, in fact, living in a form of virtual reality? Why not? Is that, is that the same thing when people re refer to as a simulation? Yeah, it is, it's called simulation theory. Mm. Yeah, and it's, the, it's not far off the matrix. But isn't, I mean, isn't that what the universe is anyway? I mean, we we assume that when we go like that and we feel something, that that's matter, that it's solid. But but you could program a brain to think that easily because, you know, your arm goes down when, when the the al algorithm or whatever it goes touch. It's it sends a sick, you know, the, the computer signals that you've got to stop there might might be that. I mean, we're all we're all ones and not not so much ones and zeros, but we are all this. You know, we've got our molecular structure. Then we've got the quantum quantum science that that maybe, under Chris. Maybe we are. Maybe we're not. Hmm. What do you want to believe? Because I don't want to believe. Is it all right that I don't want to believe? I don't care about any of this. I I I'm. What do, you, what, what do you mean? Well. So people seem to have this massive preoccupation with like gods and and death and and you know it, and, but i think all that's probably fear based whereas like i i can really i'm not i don't want to know you know i, I think I, what, what it sounds like chris is you've maybe expanded your intellect and awareness beyond certain things so therefore it probably don't challenge you enough anymore and because i don't know how you i can't answer for you chris but for me one of the things that certainly gives me purpose and what i think maybe things are about if you want to ask the grandest question of all is 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 learning like, for, mm. like as long as you're learning then you're you're evolving you're expanding because the opposite to that is is dying is, is going backwards 
is deteriorating. So for me, growing, evolving, that's about learning. Mm. So maybe for you, that sort of subject, maybe you've kind of evolved past that, maybe. For me, I'm still fascinated by big questions similar to this stuff. Why? Because I'm very interested in what other people think. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to sound like a, a, what is it, a nihilist or something like that. I just mean that, you know, if, if I could work out tomorrow what 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 god is or universe or spirit or all these different names which incidentally i just think are all just divisive they're all dividing what could possibly be a great education and learning for all of us into these pockets of this of, of animosity basically which why i always say universe it's what most people would call god i i interchange it with mother nature the thing is, I'm fascinated. You can see I think about it an awful lot, but not to the point where if I didn't get my answers, I'm really going to... It gonna... wouldn't matter whether you got the answers. Why? Because it's, it's like I said, Chris, the fascinating thing is we can think, oh, I've got the answer. No, you ain't. You, 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 it's nice that you might believe that. And... and who am I or anybody else? Who are you, I or anybody else to tell you anything different? Because belief can have so much positivity in regards to hope, faith, whatever you want to call it. Mm. It can have so much positivity. But in regards to it being definitive, perhaps, then for me, it, for me, there is no definitive. Why? Because I just see this infinite journey as if it is an infinite journey is something that is a constant journey of learning, which means that things are changing. Am I the same person that I was when I was 20? No, no, I'm a very different. If I met my 20 year old, I'd probably think, well, I, I don't know. It'd be a bit weird, but I'm certainly not the same person. So if that is, you know, 20 years later, what about another 20? or a thousand or 20,000, right? That's the fascinating thing. Oh, I've got the answers about these things. Good. You know, I like, I like your belief system. I like it, mm. but is it definitive? It's debatable. Carl, listen, uh, will you come back on again and have one of these chats with us? Well, it's been a good chat, Chris. It's always good to catch up with, um, somebody that you know you could you know i enjoy these conversations chris mm. and, and listen i think for me um i think it's important to have these sort of conversations you know for me that's what it's all about with that in mind then small talk. with that in mind can you tell us more mate about your community because i'm always thinking god i wish i had a community where i could go and have these conversations with people yeah so, well, look, there's a couple of things. I've literally just, so off the back of, obviously, our current situation, we've been going backwards in regards to social connection. So what I decided to do was set up some events, um, some workshops, where, you know, in regards to some of the things that we've spoken about, it's just really things that I think are going to interest people, but also be able to stay as lighthearted as we can as well and have a bit of a laugh. So I've... I've created some events so i've got a couple of dates um a couple of places still available on a couple of dates for the event and then off the back of that just very recently in the last couple of days i've launched something called carl's community so all of this you can find out more at carlvernon.com you go to the events tab that'll tell you about the workshops go to the carl's community tab it'll tell you more about the community and what this community is all about chris is exactly what we're talking about for me it's about bringing together like-minded people have conversations have live sessions have phone-ins and as we continue to grow let's see what happens brilliant and are where's the best place for people to buy your books everything's on carlvernon.com so you'll find everything on there videos books the whole shebang brilliant Cole, stay on the line so i can ask all the real questions after I've hit record off but <laughs> on a serious note massive massive thank you for you 
for coming on and and once again massive thank you for the work that you're you're doing um to our friends at home yes wouldn't it be a horrible planet if we weren't allowed to have chats like this whether you agree with it maybe disagree maybe learn a little bit here but disagree with something there it's that's the beauty of life isn't it we're we're not hurting anyone we're not setting out to you know bloody lord it over someone and 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 so i think uh i think freedom is good and i think freedom of speech is good so um i hope you got something from today if you could like and subscribe that would be wonderful much love to you all see you soon